Welcome to the new STV. For this year, we've thrown out the old playbook to bring you a brand new show. That's right, Jeff. We've got new hosts, new studios, and a fresh new take on the stories we'll be bringing to you each episode. And along with the help from the crew at On Snow Magazine, it's gonna be a great season. STV has been brought to you by Yamaha. Conquer snow with Yamaha. Ford F-Series, Canada's best-selling line of trucks for 52 years. Tough, smart, capable. Kimpex, fueled by fun. Twenty eighteen is the most diverse year yet when it comes to the mountain segments, which means it's harder than ever to choose the right buggy to suit your style. I mean, you've really got to be honest with yourself and what type of rider you are and where you're going to be riding to make the right decision that puts you on a machine that's going to perform the way you need it to. To help wade through the model year 18 mountain lineup, we brought in four of the best mountain riders we work with to give us their thoughts on this season's crop of sleds. Plus, we figured these guys can outride any of us Flatlanders, no matter how good we think we are in the Alpine. Trust me when I say these guys live for this type of riding. I'm from northern Idaho, up in a small town called Sandpoint. Uh, the majority of our riding is tree riding. It's tight and technical. Uh, we always have a rough trail to get in there, so you definitely have to have a well-rounded snow machine to uh, have a good time out on the snow. Our main goal riding is to find nasty, steep ravines, treat up areas, uh, try to get stuck, uh, try to blast out of the big hills. Uh, pretty much just go find new zones. The Yamaha is definitely the king of speed in the mountain class. It has enough track speed to keep you on top of the deep snow, but if you get it stuck, you better have a buddy around. It definitely will blast out of any hill you point it up. Kind of lacks in the agility area, just because it is big and heavy, but it definitely makes up in the horsepower division. Oh man, I was able to point this thing up some big hills, and sometimes there's some big wind lips and cornices at the top of the mountains, and the two-stroke machines, they kind of run out of steam at the top of the hill, and this thing just keeps pulling. It's a freight train, so this thing will blast out of those hills. For years, guys have always gotten custom suspension, uh, so you buy a snowmobile, you take your shocks off, get custom valving, or even aftermarket shocks. Now, Fox has supplied Yamaha and Articat with a QS3 that has three options. First option is for trail riding, it's a very smooth ride. Option number two is off trail riding, uh, so you have better flotation in deep snow, but you're able to still bring the skis up and wheelie. And option number three is full lockout, so it keeps the skis glued to the snow so you can blast out of big hills and keep your track speed up. But if you hit an unsuspected bump or land off of a big jump, uh, it has a bypass, so it'll blow through the valve stack and you'll still get shock strokes, so you won't bend your rails or anything. For years, guys have always wanted a shock that will do everything, and I really think Fox has nailed it with this new QS3. I think uh, the consumer really has to be honest with themselves. They have to really evaluate how much trail they're riding versus off-trail riding, uh, whether they're in deep powder all the time. A person who is up in British Columbia might want a 175 with a three inch paddle, but someone like me, where I'm from, we have wet, heavier snow most of the time, so I would prefer a 155 with maybe a two and a half inch paddle. Um, once again, there's a lot of options to choose from nowadays, uh, so you really just have to think about what type of riding you're doing.
I'm from North Idaho, and my riding style is uh, mountains and tree riding, kind of boondocking. We like to do is put tracks in places that, uh, you know, that would be shocking to other people. It's like, how did they get there? How did they get into that area or between those trees or in that tight spot? Because of all the hype um, with social media and the early uh, release of the Articat, I was dying to get on the M8000. It was very nimble. It was um, it was easy to hold a side hill with that sled. Uh, the power, I thought there wasn't a whole lot of uh, bottom end, but mid range to top end was uh, fairly impressive. And uh, it was it would take some getting used to to be able to ride it. I think uh, it'd be a little learning curve, but I think you could. Uh, it would be a true contender as a boondocking type sled. Tight trees, uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, the open meadows, I had a hard time kind of making turns and still keeping the sled. You know, it seemed like I'd wash out often. So, uh, I, but I think as far as holding the side hill in deep snow, I think it'd be a great sled. Home is Sandpoint, Idaho, so it's in the panhandle of Idaho, and it's mostly mountain riding, not much trail riding out there, so mountain sleds is kind of what I've been doing since I was 12 years old. Skidoo, I really wanted to get on that new free ride Skidoo. Previous years, like the Skidoo, I've never felt very comfortable on it, but this year is the first year that I've felt truly comfortable on the Skidoo. It really impressed me. That new 850 motor, I know they had it last year, but I guess I didn't get on it enough last year, but this year, just really all around good machine. Fits my riding style the best. Uh, mostly tree riding, but pointed to the top of the hill is always fun, you know? It just depends on what the day is, circumstances. Well, Polaris has always been a favorite of mine just because that's what I've been on since I was 12 years old, but they're kind of the same for the past few years, which is a great machine, don't get me wrong. Like, I love that machine, but just Skidoo really stood out to me this year just because it's different and fun machine. Coming up after the break, we still have more mountain stuff to tell you about. Plus, I'm going to take you on my search for a used snowmobile. Well, I'm a Minnesota Flatlander, so all my riding style is mostly flatland. Um, I've done a lot of cross-country racing. I've done a lot of snowcross racing back in the days when I was younger. And to come here up to the mountains is a little bit different riding style, which I kind of favor the Polaris. It, it turns in, it balances, it's got the balance is more from my style or my body shape. It just seems to fit a little bit better. Power delivery, stuff like that is more in sync with me than some of the other sleds. Very user friendly, you just jump on it and go, you feel comfortable right away. Five, 10 seconds on the, on the sled and you, you felt comfortable. There was no learning curve. The learning curve was very sh short. Some of the manufacturers have drivability that just seems a little bit off for me for my riding style. And it, and it definitely goes back to my riding style that I pick up on this. It's power delivery out of the corners, the initial track spin, the how it tilts in. It's just, I think a lot of it can be corrected with adjustability on, of the sled itself, the handlebar positions, the throttle positions, stuff that somebody else has left in a different position that I'm not real comfortable with. The sleds are either too long in some places, the really long mountain sleds are too long, and other places there's not enough paddle, not enough track. It all depends on where you're going and the circumstances that you ride in. Um, we're in tight, tight, tight trees, I mean extremely tight, and the long sleds just didn't get around the trees. We're having issues. The shorter sleds, excellent, phenomenal. They just turned in and cut and through the trees and you're having a riot. But it's all about the sled and where you ride and the conditions. And some snow conditions make a tremendous difference. There's no keeping up with these guys. These, these kids, 
What they can do with sleds nowadays, we didn't learn that. Our learning curve at my age is, is, is not like their learning curve. They learn new things. They do new things with sleds every year. They, do, they can pull a new rabbit out of the hat, so to say, and they do something with the sled that I just go, sit back and shake my head and go, where did they learn this? How did they learn this so quick on these new sleds? These new sleds are way, way more capable than what we were ever growing up with. Riding the latest and greatest sleds is fun, I'm not going to lie. It can make for a pretty darn good day at work. But for a long time, work wasn't snowmobiles and I couldn't ride the latest and greatest. I basically couldn't afford them. Plus, I had other interests that ate up any cash that occasionally burned a hole in my pocket. Jumping back into the snowmobile world, I didn't want to always be riding the newest machines. I wanted something used. The same type of sled that a lot of you guys ride. So that's what I'm on a mission for. A decent used sled that's something just about any budget can handle, and because this is a sled I plan to actually ride this season, it can't be a total crap can either. So I've got a total budget of about 5,000 bucks to spend. I've been looking around online for a bit now, checking out used sites and dealerships for their online inventory. I've even gone to a couple of dealerships and private sellers looking for sleds, but I think I've finally found what I'm looking for here at Spoiled Sports. When it comes to buying a used sled, you can go private or through the dealer. Each have their advantages and disadvantages. Privately, you might have more success negotiating, but it's buyer beware. Alternatively, at a dealer, you get the peace of mind the sled has been inspected by a professional, but you may find there isn't much room for negotiation on price. Privately, you may see wildly varied pricing, so you have to remember that asking is not getting. But on the other hand, if there is a good deal to be had, you better be ready to jump on it quick, otherwise the deal would be gone. We've come to Spoiled Sports today because there is a sled here that I'm interested in and Paul has some good words of advice when it comes to buying a used sled and what's the best time of year to buy in. So the fall months, in my opinion, is the best time to buy a used sled. So in, in early October, you have your trade-ins. We still have our trade-ins from last year. So when you get into end of November, December, you're going to have the trade-ins on the trade-ins and then the trade-ins on those trade-ins. So they kind of, they keep getting um, older and less nice kind of thing. So if you're looking to buy a good trade-in sled, October is the month to do it because we still have the cream of the crop. Another good piece of advice Paul talked about is booking an appointment at a dealership to have that sled you're thinking about buying from a private individual inspected. If you feel your mechanical skills aren't the best when it comes to an inspection, buying an hour or two of shop time at a dealer can save you thousands in the long run, especially if the sled you're thinking about buying has some hidden issues you might not spot on your own. When they buy a snowmobile from us, it's already been into our shop. It's, it gets whatever it needs, it gets before it goes out front for sale. When that customer buys that machine, it's ready to go and it's going to be a trouble-free machine uh, for at least that whole year. We have seen people come in who bought sleds privately. Uh, they'll bring their machines in for a pre-season and before you know it, their bill is through the roof and we got to be the bearer of bad news. Dealers are also looking to build their customer base and they want to help you buy any snowmobile that will keep you coming back into their stores. So use that to your advantage by taking advantage of these professionals. There is negotiating that, that you can do at a dealership although it's not a huge number. Um, there usually is a little wiggle room in there. Um, a lot of times it'd be better to ask for a spare belt or a jug of oil or something along those lines. That would be more feasible as, as a throw in on that sale. The key to buying a used sled is knowledge. The more you know about the sled you intend to buy, the better the buy is you're gonna make. Also, set your budget and try to identify the make and model of sled you wanna ride and go out and find it. It may seem obvious, Choose a sled and stick to your budget, but sometimes you just have to hear it. I found the sled that I was looking for, and a little later on, I'm gonna show it to you. The original Snow Scoot. Man, these things are a blast. But the new 2018 Yamaha Snow Scoot and the kissing cousin Articat ZR200 have created quite a buzz since we first got a look at these kid-sized sleds last spring. 
Now for a lot of folks, they think the new 200 is going to be the perfect sled to bridge the gap between a 120 and a full size snowmobile. But the 200 has the potential to be something much, much bigger. In my opinion, the new snow scoot is the most significant snowmobile to be introduced in the past decade. Yeah, I know. It's not the flashy full-size sled that most of us want to be riding this winter, but the snow scoot represents something to a group of riders that no one, not the manufacturers, not the aftermarket, not even the media has paid much attention to lately. Families. The 200 has the potential to attract new riders and new families to this sport, and that's a really big deal. The snowmobile industry needed something that would bring in new people to the sport. So the industry is, is getting older and it's aging. Um, and with that, it, there's young people that we need to attract to the industry. So we need to bring people that aren't typically snowmobilers in. And with Snow Scoot, we can appeal to a larger market. So the, the outdoors people, the people that are maybe skiers or hikers that don't get outside in the winter, with Snow Scoot, we encourage them to get out to try a winter sport. It's not an intimidating snowmobile. Anyone can jump on it and have a lot of fun. And it's not at a price point that's hard for most families to afford. So the overall package is, is very easy for someone to get into and it's not intimidating. So bringing new people into the sport starts with something like that. Getting them in where they're comfortable before they make the transition to a bigger snowmobile. Back in the mid 1980s, Yamaha was the market share leader. Thanks to the groundbreaking 1984 Yamaha Phaser. Now Yamaha took their leadership role very seriously in fact, they felt it was their obligation to attract new riders to the sport, and that was one of the driving forces behind the original Snow Scoot. The Snow Scoot was easy to use, it was affordable, and if things worked out as Yamaha had hoped, well, it would lead to participation from the entire family into the sport. First, as our 50th anniversary in 2018, I think it serves as a great significant milestone for us. It allows us to kind of resonate back to what we've been doing for the last 50 years and almost and, and lays a blueprint to what the next 50 years brings for Yamaha. So I think it's definitely an exciting, uh, iconic um, model for us to come out with at a very significant time in, in, our, uh, in our timeline. Fast forward 30 years, and that's exactly what Yamaha is hoping to accomplish with the new snow scoot. Now they're doing more than just hoping. Already every major race circuit across North America has a class for the 200, and undoubtedly the sled is on Christmas wish list across the snow belt. And Yamaha has a program in place to inform and educate families who are considering the sport of snowmobiling for the very first time. Another way that we've uh, tried to approach them is by offering them non-intimidating outlets and ways for them to get information. So we're going to have a how-to uh, website that will really educate new consumers and new enthusiasts on how to get involved in snowmobiling, how to ride a snowmobile, how to even properly transport and secure a snowmobile so that they can move it around to different destinations. So. We want to create uh, an outlet for consumers to come that isn't necessarily statistic and, and horsepower heavy where that might intimidate them or kind of make them back off from getting involved where it's something that's friendly, non-intimidating, that's open to questions and will answer any questions that you may have so that they can really invest their money in the right spots and, and invest their time in, in the right areas as well. Of course, the biggest reason I love the new snow scoot is the same reason why I love my old snow scoot. No matter your age or size, it's fun. And that's what snowmobiling is all about. Absolutely, I mean, I love the, the innovative and new and exciting products that Yamaha always comes out with. The snow scoot is just one of many that is gonna continue to kind of grow not only the snowmobile industry, but the motorsports industry as a whole. So it's, it's an exciting time to, to be involved. I don't watch much TV, but when I do, it's STV. And here she is, an O10 Dragon. 
I mean, ain't she a beaut? I mean, check this girl out. Like, just looking at the bodywork, it's in pristine condition. Actually, it is. There's not really anything wrong with it at all. And that's probably due to the fact that this old girl's only got 1,700 miles on it. And for a machine that's eight years old, that's not too bad. Now, some of the other goodness on this machine, well, let's start at the back. It comes with this luggage carrier back here, so that's a very desirable accessory. Moving forward, we've got a seat, good thing. Over here, we've got electric start with a battery that actually starts this thing, so that's a good thing, and it's got the uh, electronic reverse on it too, so this thing's pretty well uh, appointed. Plus, it is the Dragon package, so that means way up front, we've got the Walker Evans shock package on this thing, which is the more spicy trail uh, type of suspension that Polaris offered back in the day. I seem to remember they work pretty good. Now these things do need to be rebuilt and that's some of the things that we got to do. In addition to that, the skis are junk so we have to replace those and the track, well, it's seen better days as well. So what we have to do is a new track, suspension rebuild on the shocks and new skis and this old girl is should be ready to hit the trails. Now we bought it for about three grand so that's not too bad and considering the things that we have to do, we should have less than 5,000 bucks in this buggy to get it on the snow to have a reliable sled. Now there's some other things that we want to do too. There's some needs and wants. So we need to do the skis, the shocks, and the track. But what I want to do is maybe upgrade it to a 136 inch track at the back, because right now this thing is only a 121. Also on the front, maybe do a wrap, try to find some performance mods for the engine type of thing, nothing major to keep the reliability in there, and maybe upgrade the suspension to a more modern shock, uh, coilover shock package. But other than that, I seem to remember this sled to be a really good one back in the day, and I can't see any reason why it's not a really good sled today. So I'm really looking forward to riding this thing this year. Hey, thanks for hanging with us this week on STV. For me, it was pretty good getting back in the groove, and for you, hopefully, by the time you watch this show, there's a ton of snow outside, so get out there. Till next time, keep it between the trees. Oh, this is a dirty girl. It's gonna take forever to clean that. Hey, wait a second, where's Logan? Logan, got a job for you. <laughs>